doesn't know what's happening or doesn't want to know. But he, on one occasion, in one of these private sessions with his confidant and distant cousin, uh, uh, Daisy Sukli, he says, uh, in effect, I, I am very sick, much sicker than uh, I have been told. And if uh, I am sick enough, I will not run for another term. I must be convinced that I can complete another term. He's talking about a fourth term. And as we know, uh, he, uh, he, he's right on one count. He runs again. He's wrong on another count. He dies only four months into his fourth term. Unfortunately, um, no, fortunately, I have about 100 more questions for you, <laughs> but unfortunately, it's, uh, time is up. Our guest has been Joseph Persico. His book is called Roosevelt's Secret War. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Brian. Roosevelt's Secret War by Joseph Persico will be available in paperback from Random House. You're watching Book TV on C-SPAN 2, created by the cable t television industry. Coming up at noon Eastern, the, the blank slate, Stephen Pinker's consideration of human na nature. Then spy dust. Two masters of disguise reveal the tools and operations that helped win the Cold War. Tonight on, on Book TV, My America, Hugh Downs' new compilation of essays from, from 150 Americans. After that, Salman Rushdie on, on a decade of, of nonfiction and essays. And on Public Lives, Kenyan political activist Kawigi Wa Wamwire, whose memoir is called I Refuse to Die. Today on Book TV, an Authors Guild panel on writing biographies. You'll hear from Robert Caro, Sylvia Nasser, David Levering Lewis, and Gene Strauss. This Book TV feature airs at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. Today we'll take you back to the National Book Festival for an encore presentation of author and historian David McCullough. His talk focused on over 35 books that made a difference in his life, including All the King's Men, a Tree Grows in Brooklyn, and Tender is the Night. The entire list is available now at booktv.org. You can also watch the program online and join a discussion group. Tune in to Book TV today at 6 p.m. Eastern as David McCullough talks about his favorite books. Steven Pinker is a professor of psychology at MIT and author of The Blank Slate, The Modern Denial of Human Nature, number 10 on this week's New York Times bestseller list. In the book, Professor Pinker argues that genetics is a main component in human nature. This talk runs an hour and 25 minutes. Thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and be able to welcome you to our home. Uh, we also have a brand new building at 505th Street, which we're very proud of, which we just moved into this summer. Before introducing the speaker, let me just take this opportunity to introduce the academies. Uh, we call ourselves now the National Academies. I'm the president of one of those, the National Academy of Sciences. There are also two other presidents upstairs, National Academy of Engineering and the Institute of Medicine. Together, these three honorary organizations have about 5,000 members. And then there is an operating arm, the National Research Council, that completes this uh, organization, which is why we call ourselves the National Academies, because it's just too complicated. Our major function, besides honoring uh, outs outstanding scientists and engineers, is to carry out uh, studies for the U.S. government, uh, on any matter of science or technology that they need advice on. Uh, most recently, we completed a very major effort uh, publishing an uh, important report on science and technology for countering terrorism 
uh, an effort that involves some 120 volunteer uh, committee members. So it's a major effort that's been playing directly into the plans for the new Department on Homeland Security. Well, I invite you to visit us not only in person but on the web. Uh, all of our reports, more than 2,500 of them, are, can be read directly online. Today's lecture, of course, is by Dr. Steven Pinker. He's a professor of psychology in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His research has focused on visual cognition and on the psychology of language. It turns out he received his undergraduate degree from McGill University and his PhD in psychology from Harvard. He was on the faculties of Harvard and Stanford universities before moving to MIT in 1982. He's uh, received from this academy on this stage, the year before I became president, in 1993, uh, one of our awards called the Trollin Research Award, which we give to young investigators to recognize unusual achievements. It's only 10 years ago, he's still pretty young. <laughs> he's also won numerous other awards, including two from the American Psychological Association, and I think very importantly, uh, teaching awards for his uh, service to students and the next generation of researchers at MIT. He has, of course, written several best-selling books, he, and he's won uh, multiple awards for two of his popular science books, The Language Instinct and How the Mind Works. He also writes frequently for the pop popular pre press, including the New York Times, uh, Time Slate, and the New Yorker magazines. Uh, the the topic tonight, of course, is the topic of his latest book. I don't really have to say the title. <laughs> it's up there in a beautiful form. Uh, it's already been announced that he will be doing a book signing, but in addition, what wasn't announced, there will be some refreshments afterwards in the Great Hall. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Pinker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everyone needs a theory of human nature. Everyone has to anticipate the behavior of others, and that means we all need theories, tacit or explicit, about what makes people tick. So much depends on our theory of human nature. We use our conceptions of human nature to manage our relationships, to bring up our children, to control our own behavior. The assumptions uh, about learning in our theory of human nature guide our policies in education. Its assumptions about motivation guide our policies in law and government. And because a theory of human nature delineates what we can achieve easily, what we can achieve only with sacrifice or pain, and what we cannot achieve at all, it affects our values, what we think we can reasonably strive for as individuals and as a society. It's no surprise, then, that for millennia, theories of human nature were tied up in religion. And indeed, the Judeo-Christian uh, theory of uh, human life, as it evolved over centuries, has commitments about what we would today consider to be the subject matter of psychology and biology. For example, in the Judeo-Christian theory, the mind is a system with a number of faculties, such as a capacity for love, a moral sense that presents us with standards of right and wrong, and an ability to make choices, which is free in the sense that it isn't uh, subject to the laws of cause and effect. Uh, we have free will, uh, but it has an innate tendency to choose sin. Uh, <laughs> in this theory, there's also an um, explanation for uh, how perception and cognition work. Uh, we know the world because God designed our mental faculties to be in synchrony with the way the world is. And there's even a theory of mental health, that mental health comes from accepting God's purpose, uh, from loving God and loving our fellow humans for the, God's sake. Now, the Judeo-Christian theory uh, was motivated by particular events narrated in the book of Genesis. For example, the doctrine of free will comes from the part of the Genesis story that says that Adam and Eve were punished for eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge, which implies that they could have chosen otherwise, which implies that free will exists. 
Now, today, no scientifically literate person can believe that the events narrated in Genesis literally took place. And as a result, uh, there's been a need for a different grounding of human nature. And with the decline of fundamentalism, I think that modern intellectual life tacitly committed itself to three doctrines, each of them associated with a dead white male. <laughs> uh, the first is the blank slate, or the tabula rasa, commonly associated with this man, John Locke, although a uh, search of his writings, which is now easy to do because they're all on the internet, uh, shows that he actually never used the expression blank slate, but here's what he did write. He said, let us suppose the mind to be, as we say, white paper, void of all characters without any ideas. How comes it to be furnished? Whence comes it by that vast store which the busy and boundless fancy of man has painted on it with an almost endless variety? Whence has it all the materials of reason and knowledge? To this I answer in one word from experience. Now, the blank slate uh, is a doctrine with a great deal of moral and political appeal. In Locke's time, it implied that dogmas, such as the divine right of kings, were not self-evident truths implanted into our brains, but rather they had to be justified by experiences that people shared and therefore could debate. It undermines a hereditary royalty and aristocracy who could claim no more uh, grounds for virtue and wisdom if their minds started out as blank as everyone else's. <laughs> and by the same token, it undermined the institution of slavery because slaves could no longer be held to be innately inferior or subservient. And uh, this set of ideas is nicely captured in the following cartoon that I clipped out of The New Yorker where one king says to another, I don't know anything about the bell curve, but I say heredity is everything. <laughs> now, we continue to see an influence of the blank slate in modern intellectual life and sometimes in unexpected places. Psychology, for most of the 20th century, tried to explain all human behavior through a few simple mechanisms of association uh, and conditioning. The social sciences try to explain all cultural and social patterns through uh, the idea of socialization and culture as an autonomous force. Um, here is an example from a prominent social scientist of the 20th century who wrote, with the exception of the instinctoid reactions in infants to sudden withdrawals of support and to sudden loud noises, the human being is entirely instinctless. Man is man because he has no instincts, because everything he is and has become, he has learned, acquired from his culture, from the man-made part of, of the environment, from other human beings. And that's a quote from the anthropologist and public intellectual Ashley Montague. Here's another example uh, of how widespread the doctrine is. Um, I think of a child's mind as a blank book. During the first years of his life, much will be written on the pages. The quality of that writing will affect his life profoundly. And that is a quote from Walt Disney. <laughs> now, there, there's a second doctrine that often accompanies the blank slate, which uh, comes from, uh, whose name comes from a poem by John Dryden called The Conquest of Grenada. I am as free as nature first made man, ere the base laws of servitude began, when wild in woods the noble savage ran. Now, the noble savage is more commonly attributed to this man, the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And here's what Rousseau actually uh, did write. So many authors have hastily concluded that man is naturally cruel and requires a regular system of police to be reclaimed, whereas nothing can be more gentle than him in his primitive state. The more we reflect on this state, the more convinced we shall be that it was the best for man and that nothing could have drawn him out of it but some fatal accident which should never have happened. The example of the savages seems to confirm that mankind was formed ever to remain in this condition, that it is the real youth of the world, and that all ul ulterior improvements have been so many steps in appearance towards the perfection of individuals, but in fact towards the decrepitness of the species. Now, you can't really understand someone unless you know who he was arguing against, and indeed, Rousseau was arguing against uh, so many authors, and the main author that he had in mind was this man, uh, in particular the following passage. Hereby it is manifest that during the time men live without a common power to keep them all in awe, they are in that condition which is called war, and such a war is of every man against every man. 
In such condition, there is no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain and consequently no culture of the earth, no navigation, no commodious building, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. This, of course, is the famous passage from Thomas Hobbes's Leviathan. Now, there's a great deal of appeal to the doctrine of the noble savage, which Rousseau used to oppose Hobbes. If, uh, in a state of nature, we are naturally peaceable, then there's no need for a domineering Leviathan, a government and police force, to keep us uh, from each other's throats. If we're basically nasty, then conflict is a permanent part of the human condition. Whereas if we're basically noble, we can work for a utopian society of the future. Children are born savages, so if the inner savage in us is nasty, then child rearing must be an arena of discipline and conflict. Whereas if the savage in us is basically noble, then child rearing consists of providing children with opportunities to develop their potential. Like the blank slate, the noble savage has had a widespread influence in modern intellectual life. We see it in the respect for everything natural and the distrust of anything man-made. Natural pharmaceuticals, natural foods, natural yogurt, natural childbirth, and so on. We see it in the unfashionability of authoritarian styles of child rearing. We see it uh, in the understanding of social problems as repairable defects in our institutions as opposed to a more traditional view in which they would be seen as part of the inherent tragedy of the human condition. And there's a third doctrine that uh, goes along with the noble savage and the blank slate, commonly associated with this gentleman, the philosopher René Descartes. Descartes wrote, when I consider my mind, I cannot distinguish any parts, but apprehend it to be clearly one and entire. The faculties of willing, conceiving, etc., cannot be said to be its parts, for it is one the same mind which employs itself in willing and in feeling and in understanding. But it is quite otherwise with corporeal objects, for there is not one of them imaginable by, by me which my mind cannot easily divide into parts. This is sufficient to teach me that the mind or soul of man is entirely different from the body, a doctrine which s several centuries later was derided as the doctrine of the ghost in the machine by the philosopher Gilbert Ryle, and no, the police did not invent that term in the album by that name. They stole it from Ryle. <laughs> the ghost in the machine uh, also has a great deal of moral and emotional appeal. Um, people don't like to think of themselves as glorified uh, gears and springs. Uh, because m machines are insensate, built to be used and disposable, whereas humans are sentient, possessing of dignity and rights, and precious, a notion that seems to come out of the doctrine that we have a soul that's separate from the mechanism of the body. Machines have some workaday purpose, like grinding corn or sharpening pencils. Humans, uh, we like to think, have a higher purpose, love, worship, good works, knowledge, beauty. Machines follow the ineluctable laws of physics, whereas behavior, we like to think, is freely chosen. With choice comes optimism about possibilities for the future, and with choice comes responsibility and the ability to hold other people accountable for their behavior. Finally, if the mind is completely separate from the body, that holds out the hope that the mind can survive the death of the body, an idea whose emotional appeal, I think, is all too obvious. Uh, like the other two doctrines, the ghost in the machine has had a widespread influence. Freedom, dignity, and responsibility are often seen as incompatible with a biological view of the mind, which is commonly condemned as being reductionist or determinist. Now, no one really knows what these words mean, but everyone knows that there's something bad. <laughs> uh, we see it in the stem cell debate, where uh, a number of the theologians who weighed in uh, with uh, President Bush uh, the summer before last uh, couched the issue in terms of when ensoulment takes place, which means that perhaps the most promising medical technology of the 21st century is debated in terms of when the ghost first enters the machine. <laughs> and we see it even in, in uh, everyday thinking and speech, as when we talk about John's brain, which seems to presuppose some entity, John, that's separate from the brain that it owns. 
uh, and when journalists speculate about brain transplants, whereas in fact they should really uh, discuss body transplants because as the philosopher Dan Dennett once pointed out, this is the one such operation in which it's better to be the donor than the recipient. <laughs> Now, there's a big problem with a blank slate, um, and that is blank slates don't do anything. They would just sit there forever receiving inscriptions unless they had something uh, in, t in their organization that actively recombined the inscriptions on the slate and used them in pursuit of certain goals. No one denies the importance of learning, socialization, and culture. Only a madman would say everything is in the genes and that our experience doesn't count. The question, though, is what are we born with that allows us to learn and that allows experience to leave its trace on future uh, behavior? When Locke uh, said there is nothing in the intellect that was not first in the senses, I think the perfect reply came from Leibniz when he said, except for the intellect itself. Uh, and indeed, it's this recognition that has led to a number of threats to the blank slate from contemporary sciences that are studying the human mind. For example, my own field, cognitive science, has underscored that you need innate mechanisms to do the learning to begin with, and that these innate mechanisms uh, are complex and multiple. Uh, cognitive scientists have argued uh, that uh, babies are born with some concept of an object and of causation that we have a number sense, a number of spatial representations that allow the brain to keep track of the environment and of objects in it, a theory of mind or intuitive psychology by which we infer the mental states of other people when we interact with them, and uh, a language instinct that allows us to communicate our thoughts, and executive systems of the frontal lobes which receive information from many parts of the brain and that affect decisions that the rest of the brain and body carry out. Evolutionary psychology has uh, challenged the blank slate by showing that beneath all of the cultural variation that anthropologists have trumpeted for the last hundred years, there's also a bedrock of universals, emotions and behavior patterns that are shared by all human beings uh, across the world's 6,000 cultures. Recently, the anthropologist Donald Brown has cataloged them. Uh, he's found a good 300 <laughs> universals, everything from uh, aesthetics, affection, and ambivalence, uh, all the way down to verbs, violence, vowels, weaning, weapons, and attempts to control the weather. <laughs> Evolutionary psychology has undermined the blank slate in another way by showing that many human drives uh, can't be seen as ways in which people calculate what's best for them in their own day-to-day uh, -day lives, but rather can only be understood as adaptations to an ancestral environment in which we evolved, which may not be relevant to our happiness and well-being today. An obvious example is our taste for sugar, salt, and fat, which has uh, obvious uh, health consequences, as many of us eat ourselves into an early grave with too much junk food. Uh, but this, it's perfectly understandable why we have those tastes. Those are um, precious nutrients, and in an, in an environment in which they were in short supply, a taste for them would have been adaptive. Now that we can crank out mass quantities of the stuff, our taste for them hasn't changed, and uh, that does us more uh, harm than good. A thirst for revenge and a willingness to defend your interests with uh, violent defenses of one's honor uh, uh, lead to a great deal of unnecessary suffering, vendettas, blood feuds, uh, cycles of revenge, and so on, but were necessary in an, a world in which you couldn't dial 911 to get Leviathan to show up to settle your scores for you. And a reputation for toughness was one's own def only defense against being a uh, punching bag. And less obvious um, example is our desire for attractive mates. Now, a number of years ago, the humorist Fran Lebowitz made a very insightful observation about human psychology. She said, people who marry someone that they're attracted to are making a terrible mistake. You really should marry your best friend. You like your best friend more than you're likely to like anyone that you happen to be physically attracted to. You don't pick your best friend because they have a cute nose. But that's all you're doing when you're getting married. You're saying, I'm going to spend the rest of my life with you because of your lower lip. <laughs> now, this is a puzzle. And I, th 
think the uh, solution to it is demonstrations that uh, many of the uh, anatomical signs of beauty are in fact uh, advertisements of health, fertility, and fitness. And in being attracted to people with that facial geometry, we're maximizing the chances that our genes will combine with the best uh, other genes. Neuroscience has shown that there's a complex genetic patterning uh, to the brain, although uh, it's obvious that the brain has a great deal of plasticity, which is necessary for us to learn and remember. Um, there's also a great deal of complex structure that's laid out in the course of um, development in utero. This is a diagram of the primate visual system. It's not an oil refinery. Um, comprised of some 50 distinct areas interconnected in precise ways. And it's not just the overall cabling of the brain that is partly under uh, genetic control during development, but some of the fine structure that makes one brain different from another. Here's a diagram from a recent study by the neurobiologist uh, Paul Thompson and his colleagues at UCLA, in which they measured using MRI the distribution of gray matter in different parts of the brain of a large sample of people. And they tested for correlations between amounts of brain matter in different parts of the cortex and plotted them in false color so that uh, purple represents uh, zero correlation and uh, colors that differ from uh, purple that are green and yellow and pink and so on represent significant correlations. Now if you pair people at random, by definition the correlations are zero and here you see in a left view of the brain, right view of the brain, top view of the brain, what zero correlation looks like. This is what happens when a pair of people share half their genes, namely fraternal <coughs> twins. You can see that large amounts of the brain uh, show correlations from one twin to another. And this is what happens when you share all your genes. Um, there are areas with very strong correlations and virtually and large parts of the brain show some correlation, showing, suggesting that the shared genes build brains that are more similar. And it's likely that these aren't just um, anatomical curly cues like your earlobes or your fingerprints, but have functional consequences. Uh, nicely summed up in this cartoon, also from The New Yorker, by uh, Chaz Adams. Uh, separated at birth, the Malifert twins meet accidentally. <laughs> now, this is only um, somewhat of an exaggeration. Studies of identical twins who were separated at birth and then are tested in adulthood show that they often have astonishing similarities. Uh, my favorite example being the uh, twins, one of whom was brought up in, as a Catholic in a Nazi family in Germany. The other was brought up uh, as a Jew in a family in Trinidad. Nonetheless, when they met each other as adults, it turned out that both of them kept rubber bands around their wrist. Both of them dipped buttered toast in coffee. Both of them flushed the toilet both before using it and after using it. And both of them liked to sneeze in crowded elevators to watch everyone jump. <laughs> Now, these admittedly are anecdotes, but they're never, they've never been documented in any pair of fraternal twins separated at birth and reunited in adulthood, and they're corroborated by uh, the best measuring instruments known to psychology. Uh, that is, that there are um, enormous similarities among twins reared apart, which leads to what's sometimes called the first law of behavioral genetics, which is that all behavioral traits are partially heritable, although uh, nowhere near completely. The noble savage has also uh, come under attack from uh, studies of, uh, of mind, brain, and behavior. Behavioral genetics has shown that among the traits that are heritable are antagonism, uh, unconscientiousness, tendencies towards violent crime, and psychopathy. Neuroscience has identified brain mechanisms uh, in, among primates that are associated with aggression. Evolutionary psychology and anthropology have underscored the ubiquity of conflict in human societies, just as we see elsewhere in the animal kingdom. Now here is a, a diagram of uh, a graph of the percentage of male deaths due to warfare in a variety of societies. That is, if you're a male, what are the chances that you will die at the hands of some other man as opposed to dying uh, peaceably in your bed or by any other uh, way? 
Uh, the red bars are from a variety of pre-state societies, hunter-gatherer and hunter-horticultural societies in the New Guinea highlands and the Amazon rainforest, and they range from about 10% to uh, almost 60%. The tiny little blue bar at the lower left uh, represents the United States and Europe in the 20th century and includes the statistics from both world wars. So, not to put too fine a point on it, but when it comes to man in a state of nature, Hobbes was right, Rousseau was wrong. <laughs> now, what about our own society, where we enjoy this uh, relatively low uh, rate of death by violence? Well, um, here's a revealing question, and I'll, I'll pose it to you, and I beg you not to answer aloud, but keep the answer to yourself. H have you ever thought about killing someone? Okay, please don't answer. Well, psychologists are busybodies, and they have asked this question of large samples of people. And here's a typical result. Uh, about a third of men and 15% of women frequently think about killing people they don't like. <laughs> and about three quarters of men and more than 60% of women at least occasionally think about killing people they don't like. And many of you are probably thinking, yeah, and the rest are liars. <laughs> The ghost in the machine has also uh, come under uh, attack. Uh, cognitive science has shown that intelligence uh, doesn't require some ghostly substance. Uh, it's not some act of magic, but it can be explained in mechanistic terms. That one can think of beliefs as a kind of information, thinking as a form of computation, not the kind of computation that your Macintosh does, but rather a form of presumably analog, uh, parallel, fuzzy computation, but computation nonetheless, and that emotions can be understood as mechanisms of feedback and control, uh, a little bit like your, uh, like your thermostat. Artificial intelligence has underscored that uh, intelligence is, can be understood as a physical process by building uh, computers and robots that can uh, do intelligent things, the most famous example being the defeat of the world chess champion Garry Kasparov by the program Deep Blue uh, six years ago. Uh, neuroscience has undermined the ghost in the machine through what Francis Crick called the astonishing hypothesis in his book of, of that title, the hypothesis that all of our thoughts and feelings, all of our desires and joys and uh, aches and passions consist of the physiological activity of the tissues of the brain. And astonishing though this hypothesis may be, uh, there's a great deal of evidence that it's uh, true. We know that every form of mental activity gives off electrical signals that we can now detect, and moreover that by sending an electrical current into the brain, the person can undergo a vivid, lifelike uh, experience. We know that the uh, brain is a, a uh, chemical organ and that uh, administrations of chemicals, such as in uh, drugs, can change perception, thought, and uh, mood. Uh, in surgery, uh, if a surgeon severs the corpus callosum joining the two cerebral hemispheres, then you've got two consciousnesses taking place within one skull as if the soul could be bisected with a knife. When a brain is damaged by uh, strokes and other uh, diseases, a part of the person can uh, vanish. We know that the brain has a staggering complexity, 100 billion neurons interconnected by 100 trillion synapses which is fully commensurate with the uh, remarkable complexity of human thought and behavior. And there's every reason to believe that when the brain dies, the person goes out of existence. Despite intensive efforts by a number of 19th century scientists, no one has been able to figure out a way to communicate with the dead. And this idea uh, is not as new as you might think, but uh, it was first articulated in the uh, Brothers Karamazov in the scene in which Dmitry Karamazov is, uh, has been visited by a local medical researcher and is now telling his brother what he's just learned. He says, imagine inside, in the nerves, in the head, there are sort of little tails. I look at something with my eyes, and when they begin quivering, those little tails, an image appears. That is, an object or an action, damn it. That's why I see and then think, because of those tales, not because I've got a soul and that I am some sort of image and likeness. Rakitin explained it all to me yesterday, brother, and it simply bowled me over. It's magnificent, Alyosha, this science. A new man's arising. 
That I understand, and yet I am sorry to lose God. Well, indeed, uh, people are sorry to lose God or the values that they associate with God when they hear of the, the new science. And there's been widespread fear and loathing of uh, the sciences of human nature, both from the left and from the right. Uh, an example from the academic left is the uh, famous manifesto against sociobiology, um, authored by Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Lewinton and others. Uh, I'll give you a quote. The reason for the survival of these recurrent determinist theories is that they consistently tend to provide a genetic justification of the status quo and of existing privileges for certain groups according to class, race, or sex. These theories provided an important basis for the enactment of sterilization laws and also for the eugenics policies which led to the establishment of gas chambers in Nazi Germany. And partly because of this uh, these accusations, E.O. Wilson, who the author of Sociobiology, was hounded by demonstrators uh, wherever he went to speak in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, as we see in this poster from one college campus, uh, Edward O. Wilson, so, come in here, Edward O. Wilson, sociobiologist and the prophet of right-wing patriarchy, and at the bottom of the poster it says, bring noisemakers. <laughs> but it isn't only the uh, left that's been upset, but also the religious and cultural right. For example, in the Weekly Standard, Andrew Ferguson wrote that biological theories of the mind are sure to give you the creeps because whether a behavior is moral, whether it signifies virtue, is a judgment that the new science and materialism in general cannot make. And he contrasted biological theories with the Judeo-Christian view, according to which human beings are persons from the start endowed with a soul created by God and infinitely precious. And this is the common understanding the new science means to undo. Uh, this is a, a widespread belief among the uh, political, religious, and cultural right. For example, the uh, Republican uh, majority whip Tom DeLay offered this, the following explanation for the horrific Columbine High School shootings uh, four years ago. He said that they were inevitable because our school systems teach children that they are nothing but glorified apes evolutionized out of some primordial soup of mud. And similarly, the U.S. House Judiciary Committee received the following testimony from a creationist uh, institute about the dangers of Darwinism. They cited the lyrics of the following rock song, you and me baby ain't nothing but mammals, so let's do it like they do it on the Discovery Channel. <laughs> Well, uh, where does the fear and loathing come from, and how might it be addressed? That's going to be the subject of the, the rest of this talk. Um, I'm going to suggest that, there are, uh, that these fears deserve to be taken seriously, and that they are four in number. The fear of inequality, the fear of imperfectibility, the fear of determinism, and the fear of nihilism. I'll explain each one. And I'll argue that all are based on non sequiturs. All come from the fact that these this approach to human behavior is novel, not that they uh, really logically follow. And I'm going to go a bit farther and say that not only does a uh, biological understanding of the mind not have the dangers that uh, it's been accused of, but in fact there are dangers in going in the opposite direction, in denying human nature. And what this means is that we should study human nature objectively without trying to put a moral thumb on either side of the scale. Let me start with a fear of inequality. This comes from a simple mathematical fact that zero equals zero. If we're blank slates, we must be equal, but if the mind has any innate organization, then different races, sexes, or individuals could be biologically different, and that would condone discrimination and oppression. Well, I think as soon as you see the fear stated uh, so clearly, you see the flaw in it, namely that fairness does not require a belief in sameness. When Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, he did not mean we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are clones. <laughs> uh, rather, uh, the, our commitment to political equality is a recognition of certain human interests that we assume to be universal across the species, uh, as it was written, that people are endowed with certain inalienable rights and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's also a commitment to, uh, as a policy, prohibiting discrimination against individuals 
based on the statistics of certain groups that they belong to, such as race, ethnicity, or sex. That is the core of fairness and equality of opportunity, and it has nothing to do with the factual question of whether people are, all people are biologically indistinguishable. Also, there's a downside of denying uh, the possibility of individual differences. Uh, many of the uh, most horrific cases of racial and ethnic persecution in the 20th century, in fact, did not come from uh, targeting groups that were thought to be racially inferior. Um, the problem is that if you believe that uh, all people are indistinguishable, there's a temptation to treat the more successful people not as more talented, but rather as more ruthless or avaricious. And many of the atrocities of the 20th century came from persecuting ethnic groups that provided the circumstances that allowed their more talented members to uh, prosper. Examples include the uh, Indians in East Africa and the South Pacific, the Chinese in Malaysia and Indonesia, the Igbos in Nigeria, and the Jews almost everywhere. Now, the second fear is the fear of imperfectibility. The, uh, dashing the age-old dream in the perfectibility of mankind. And it runs more or less as follows. If unpleasant traits are innate, selfishness, violence, prejudice, rape, that would make them unchangeable, so attempts at social reform and human improvement would be a waste of time. Why try to make the world a better place if people are rotten to the core and will just foul it up no matter what you do? Well, this too doesn't follow. Uh, the one reason is that ignoble motives do not automatically lead to ignoble behavior. And that's because the human mind is a complex system with many parts. And some parts can counteract others. So even if we did have innate temptations towards antisocial behavior, uh, we also have a, a moral sense, uh, cognitive abilities that allow us to learn the lessons of history, and executive systems of the frontal lobes that can uh, receive information from these subsystems and use them to control behavior. Um, indeed, the moral progress that we have enjoyed over the past few centuries didn't so much come from erasing or rewriting human nature as exploiting a certain part of it. The philosopher Peter Singer wrote a book called The Expanding Circle uh, based on the idea that uh, universally people have a sense of morality. That's the good news. Uh, unfortunately, the default setting is to apply it only to the members of your own clan or village or tribe but that social progress over the centuries consists of expanding that circle and deploying the sympathy that we instinctively feel towards our own family and friends to an ever-expanding uh, circle of uh, people. We've expanded it to include uh, all races, uh, the mentally handicapped, uh, prisoners of war, uh, uh, newborn children, and most recently to all of humanity, as in the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, all of which could come from taking a knob or a slider and expanding the application of the emotion of sympathy outward rather than recreating human nature from scratch. And there are also downsides in the belief of imperfectibility, and I'll mention three of them. One of them is totalitarian social engineering. If people are blank slates, well, the temptation is to say, we damn well better control what gets written on those slates, because if we don't do it, it will happen by uh, accident. And indeed, uh, many of the, um, the uh, most atrocious totalitarian regimes in the 20th century uh, overtly believed in the blank slate. For example, Mao Zedong, probably responsible for 35 million deaths, wrote, it's on a blank page that the most beautiful poems are written. The Khmer Rouge, which massacred a quarter of their countrymen, had a slogan, only the newborn baby is spotless. And uh, much more benignly, but still um, uh, troublesome, uh, is a quote from uh, the city planner and architect Le Corbusier, who said that city planners should begin with a clean tablecloth. We must build places where mankind will be reborn. A philosophy that's uh, sometimes called uh, authoritarian high modernism, the idea that we could, we should redesign societies using, quote, scientific principles. Now, what does that mean in practice? Well, this cityscape over here is a picture of central Paris, 
uh, or at least what Paris would have looked like if Le Corbusier had been given his clean tablecloth and was able to flatten it and rebuild it according to his scientific principles. Fortunately, he was not granted that wish. Uh, the problem was that um, his theory of human needs, uh, as he described it, was that every human being needs so many cubic feet of air per minute to breathe, so many gallons of water for bathing, so many gallons of water for drinking, so many square feet for sleeping, and that was pretty much it. Uh, and that's what lead, led to his idea that cities should be designed for efficiency at meeting those needs, uh, as opposed to the chaotic, uh, noisy, dirty jumble of cities like Paris that offended his sensibilities. Well, we now see uh, where he went wrong, um, that his theory of human nature was basically the, the blank slate. And he omitted uh, many other aspects of human nature, such as the need for intimate social in, uh, interaction in comfortable spaces, uh, the universal desire of humans to be um, in the presence of living things and green space, the effect of natural light on mood, the need for uh, ornament and uh, aesthetic pleasure, a uh, human scale that makes people feel safe in de de defensible spaces, and so on. And though Le, Cor Le Corbusier was not given a clean tablecloth to flatten Paris and start all over again, uh, one of his students did design Brasilia, which is notorious as uh, one of the world's great uninviting wastelands. And it, the theory of authoritarian high modernism was uh, in part responsible for the urban renewal projects of the late 50s and early 60s, in which vibrant neighborhoods were often uh, obliterated and replaced by uh, high rises and freeways and windswept plazas. Um, another downside of perfectibility uh, is the a lack of appreciation for democracy. Many of the totalitarian regimes of the 20th, 20th century were led by idealistic, charismatic uh, leaders uh, who exerted a claim of moral superiority over their predecessors as a basis for their authority, uh, believed that their totalitarian state was just a temporary measure that uh, would eventually wither leaving us in a, a state of uh, anarchism in which people would benignly cooperate and live in peace. In contrast, democracy is based on a rather jaundiced theory of human nature, the idea that people are permanently saddled with uh, a limits on their wisdom and foresight, and the mechanisms of checks and balances were explicitly intended as a way of counteracting the natural tendency among leaders towards uh, ambition and self-deception. The idea is beautifully captured in the famous aphorism by James Madison. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. And a third downside in the belief of perfectibility, I think, is a distortion of human relationships, especially parenting. Now, here's a quote from a uh, mother that appeared in the Boston Globe on the um, uh, parenting experts. She said, I'm overwhelmed with parenting advice. I'm supposed to do lots of physical activity with my kids so I can instill in them a physical fitness habit so they'll grow up to be healthy adults. And I'm supposed to do all kinds of intellectual play so they'll grow up smart. And there are all kinds of play, clay for finger dexterity, word games for reading success, large motor play, small motor play. I feel like I could devote my life to figuring out what to play with my kids. On top of that, I have to be a short order cook, preparing two or three meals at a time, because if I force my kids to choose between eating what's there or skipping a meal, they'll get an eating disorder. <laughs> well, I think anyone who's recently been a parent and has looked into the uh, child rearing manuals can sympathize with this uh, frazzled mom. Now, uh, here are some sobering facts about uh, research on parenting. Most studies of parenting are useless. The studies that uh, gave rise to all of this advice for mothers. Why are they useless? Because they don't control for heritability. They measure some behavior uh, in the parents. They measure some trait in the children. They show there's a correlation, and they assume that correlation implies causation. It must have been the parenting behavior that shaped the child in that manner. Much of this research doesn't even test the possibility that parents uh, 
transmit genes to their children as well as an environment. And so, for example, the fact that parents who talk more to their children have kids with better language skills or parents who spank their children have children who grow up to be violent may come because there are genes that uh, predispose children to being more articulate or uh, more violent. There are studies that do control for inheritance, for example, redoing the, uh, retesting for the correlations in uh, adopted children who do get parenting uh, experience from their parents but not their genes. And here are the two findings that turn up over and over again in study after study. One of them is that siblings separated at birth end up as, sim as similar as siblings reared together. Now, remember the Malifert twins. Separated at birth, they bump into each other at the patent office with identical contraptions in their lap. Okay, that's one discovery, but that's not the one that I'm talking about here. A second discovery from that research, which is less well appreciated, but equally important, is that if the Malifert twins had, been, had grown up together in the same house with the same parents, they would have been no more similar than they, are, uh, than they would have been if they had been separated. Uh, similarly, for biological siblings, those who are separated and brought up in different homes are no more different than those brought up in the same home. Corroborating that set of studies are ones that look at similarities among adopted siblings who don't share genes but do share an environment and find that they're not similar at all in adulthood, uh, in personality or intelligence. Uh, they are no more correlated than pairs of people plucked off the street at random. Well, what are the implications? Uh, the implications are that the intellect and personalities of children are shaped not by parents, but by a combination of factors, in part, although only in part, by genes, uh, in part by the surrounding culture, both the culture of the society as a whole and the children's own culture, which we call a peer group, and in part by chance chance events in the wiring of the brain in utero in the first few years of life and perhaps chance experience. Now, I found that when people uh, hear these results, which are, uh, were first brought to the public attention by Judith Rich Harris uh, in her book, The Nurture Assumption, they often have the following reaction. So you're saying it doesn't matter how I treat my children. <laughs> now, uh, it's, it may be a natural reaction at first, but think about it. Uh, of course it matters how you treat your children. It's never okay to abuse uh, or belittle or neglect children because that's a terrible thing for a big strong person to do to a small helpless one who is under that person's care. Child rearing, above all, is a moral responsibility. Also, um, let's say someone told you that you can't shape the personality of your spouse. Now, no one but a newlywed really believes that you can change the personality <laughs> of your spouse. Nonetheless, on, on hearing this uh, bit of wisdom, uh, no one says, oh, so you're saying it doesn't matter how I treat my spouse. <laughs> well, of course it matters how you treat your spouse. It matters to the quality of the relationship that you have uh, and the degree of pleasure and respect and uh, depth that your relationship will enjoy. Likewise, Parenting is a human relationship between two people, one of whom is a parent, one of whom is a child, and how the parent treated the child in childhood is going to affect the quality of that relationship. And I think it's a sign of the uh, influence of the blank slate that so many people could forget the simple truth, or at least when intellectualizing they can forget it, and think of parenting only as the molding or micromanaging of a child's uh, personality. When, whereas, in fact, it's much more than that. Um, let me more quickly go over the, the remaining two fears. The fear of determinism, determinism in the old philosophy sense as the opposite of free will, runs as follows. If behavior is caused by a person's biology, he can't be held responsible for it. And in fact, the fear is not totally groundless. Here is a headline that I clipped out of the Wall Street Journal a number of years ago. Man's genes made him kill his lawyer's claim. <laughs> Honest. You can uh, insert your favorite lawyer joke here. Now, uh, by the way, the defense was not successful. Uh, the, this man's genes did not get him off the hook, but there's a clear fear that in the future uh, we have to worry about this. Well, the reason the defense didn't work is, uh, I think, fairly obvious. It comes from the old saying, to understand is not to forgive. Standards of responsibility, uh, credit, blame, reward, punishment, are themselves causes of behavior. 
These standards don't have to appeal to a ghost or an immaterial soul, but rather to certain parts of the brain, presumably concentrated in the prefrontal lobes, that can inhibit behavior. We can retain this influence on the brain systems for inhibition, namely holding people responsible, even as we come to understand the brain systems for temptation. Um, also, the bogus defenses for bad behavior that have uh, made the news from our judicial system are, in fact, more likely to be environmental than biological uh, anyway. They include the abuse excuse with which the uh, Menendez brothers uh, got off the hook in their first trial by saying that the reason that they had to kill their parents is that they abused them when they were children. The black rage syndrome that the uh, radical lawyer William Kunstler proposed as a defense of the Long Island Railroad gunman who began shooting passengers at random. It was because of the stress of living in a racist society. The patriarchy made me do it defense that some lawyers have used to try to get rapists off the hook, that they were inflamed by uh, pornographic images in a misogynistic society. And perhaps the, the best example comes from uh, West Side Story, in which the juvenile delinquents tell the local police sergeant, Dear kindly Sergeant Krupke, you got to understand, it's just our bringing up key that gets us out of hand. Our mothers all are junkies, our fathers all are drunks. Golly, Moses, naturally, we're punks. <laughs> the final fear is the most nebulous. It's the fear of nihilism, the idea that biology strips life of all meaning and purpose. It says that love, beauty, and morality are just figments of a brain pursuing selfish evolutionary strategies. And a, a nice illustration of this uh, fear comes from uh, the following comic strip, in which our hero, Arlo, is pacing the floors uh, late at night, unable to sleep, racked with doubt. He says to his son, why am I here? And the boy says, to pass on your genes. <laughs> you still here? <laughs> Admittedly, uh, most people are not satisfied with this answer to the question. <laughs> now, uh, I have to add that this is not just, uh, although it's often a uh, fear expressed by uh, people with, with uh, certain religious beliefs, it's not just a uh, religious worry, but it's a secular worry as well. But I'll, dis I'll discuss the religious version of this fear and the secular version separately. The religious version runs uh, uh, more or less as follows, that people need to believe in a soul which seeks to fulfill God's purpose and is rewarded or punished in an afterlife. Now, I, don't, I want to make it clear that I don't, I don't intend to argue uh, that, that uh, against religion or that people should not be religious uh, or that there's necessarily an incompatibility between religion and science. There are a number of brilliant uh, neurobiologists and evolutionary biologists who believe that there's nothing incompatible between Darwin's theory of evolution or the belief that the mind is completely a product of the brain and some kind of uh, belief in a, um, uh, a supreme being. Um, and I don't want to take on that debate. Uh, my goal is more defensive. I want to argue against the position that only religion uh, is, uh, can be the source of our uh, moral values. And here's why, in particular, the belief in a immaterial soul uh, and an afterlife. And, and here's the response to that accusation uh, from religion. First of all, um, I don't see anything so um, ennobling about a belief in a life to come because it necessarily devalues life on earth. And think about what we conclude when we remind ourselves that life is short or what we do. We uh, renew a friendship. We uh, bury the hatchet in a, uh, a silly dispute. We offer a gesture of affection. Uh, we vow not to squander our time and to use it wisely. I would argue that nothing gives life more value than the realization that every moment of consciousness is a precious gift. Also, God's purpose sounds good in the abstract, but uh, in practice, it always seems to be conveyed by human beings, and that opens the door to uh, a great deal of mischief. Um, I'm going to... Uh, uh, many of you uh, have seen the wonderful satirical newspaper called The Onion with its uh, mock news stories. And about a year ago, they ran the following headline, Hijackers Surprised to Find Selves in Hell. <laughs> we expected... 
We expected eternal paradise for this, say suicide bombers. Now, admittedly, this was criticized for being tasteless, and it is. Uh, but I think it does make an important point. Uh, uh, namely, that uh, yes, it may be true that without a belief in an afterlife, there might be some people who are uh, not deterred from uh, committing evil acts by the uh, threat of spending eternity in hell. But on the other hand, uh, they wouldn't be tempted to commit evil acts by the promise of spending eternity in heaven. Now, what about the secular version? Well, I think this is um, a, uh, nicely captured, and the flaws of it are, are quite apparent, in uh, the opening scene of Annie Hall, in which the young Woody Allen, uh, seven years old, has been taken to the family doctor by his mother. The doctor says, uh, why are you depressed, Alvy? The mother answers for him. It's something he read. Something he read, huh? The universe is expanding. <laughs> the universe is expanding? Well, the universe is everything, and if it's expanding, someday it will break apart, and that would be the end of everything. His mother says, what is that your business? He stopped doing his homework. <laughs> and Alvi says, what's the point? <laughs> now, clearly Alvi has gone wrong here, and the reason, uh, I think, is beautifully pointed out by his mother, uh, frequently a source of wisdom, uh, who says to him, what has the universe got to do with it? You're here in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is not expanding. <laughs> uh, indeed, Brooklyn is not expanding. The reason that we, uh, that we laugh at this, uh, uh, the reason we laugh at this interchange is we realize that the young Woody Allen has confused two different levels of analysis. The human level, what is meaningful to us and how we want to live our lives today, given the brains that we have, and the causal level of how and why our brains uh, cause us to have those thoughts uh, to begin with. They're related, but they're not the same, and it's important not to confuse them. Even if evolution is an amoral process with no purpose, in which genes, according to the metaphor, selfishly uh, maximize copies of themselves, that doesn't mean that people are also amoral or purpose, uh, purposeless or selfish, only the process that uh, led them to evolve had those properties. My final point is that um, morality uh, certainly is not a, uh, a hallucination or a fiction invented by our brains, but there is an inherent logic in it that the human moral sense can be thought to implement, uh, a point made uh, by uh, centuries of philosophers, but I think best illustrated once again in the uh, comic strips. Uh, in this case, from the uh, late lamented cartoon Calvin and Hobbes, in which Calvin uh, lays out for us uh, why we can't abandon morality or treat it as a fiction by showing the consequences of trying to do exactly that. So one day Calvin says, I don't believe in ethics anymore. As far as I'm concerned, the ends justify the means. Get what you can while the getting's good, that's what I say. Might makes right. The winners write the history books. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, so I'll do whatever I have to and let others argue about whether it's right or not. Hey, why'd you do that? You were in my way. Now you're not. The ends justify the means. I didn't mean for everyone, you dolt, just me. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, what this cartoon shows is the uh, inherent untenability of any system in which you would try to get other people to treat you in a manner different from the one that you are committed to treat other people. That logic, the golden rule, if you will, is the core of morality, and it's no coincidence that it's been independently rediscovered by many of the world's religions and uh, great moral traditions. So to sum up, the, uh, I've argued that the dominant theory of human nature in modern intellectual life uh, is composed of the doctrines of the blank slate, the noble savage, and the ghost in the machine, that this theory is being challenged by the modern sciences of mind, brain, genes, and evolution, that these challenges are also seen to threaten our moral values, but in fact that does not follow. On the contrary, understanding what makes us tick uh, can clarify those values by showing that political equality does not require sameness, but rather policies that treat people as individuals with rights. That moral progress does not require that the mind is free of selfish motives, only that it has other motives to counteract them. Responsibility does not require that behavior is uncaused, only that it responds to contingencies of credit and blame. 
and that meaning in life does not require that the process that shaped the brain have a purpose, only that the brain itself have a purpose. Moreover, grounding values in a blank slate is a mistake because it makes our values hostages to fortune, implying that someday factual discoveries could make them obsolete, and because it conceals the downsides of denying human nature, including pers persecution of the successful, totalitarian social engineering, an exaggeration of the effects of the environment, such as in parenting and the criminal justice system, a mystification of the logic of responsibility, democracy, and morality, and the devaluing of human life on Earth. Uh, with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much. phrase in one of the earlier slides that said, study human nature objectively. Could you say a few words about that and how that could be better done by everyone studying human nature? Uh, yes. Um, for one thing, when it, all of the, the questions uh, that, that I've raised about the blank slate, the noble savage, and so on, are uh, they're empirical hypotheses that could come out one way or another. We have I think good evidence for, uh, for some hypotheses, but um, ultimately the only way to find out is to look. And in, I think there's been a distortion uh, in many of the sciences that study human beings because of a fear that certain issues are, are third rails. You touch them and die. And that distorts the range of hypotheses that are, are tested. And the studies of parenting are, are a perfect example. Um, uh, the studies that don't control for heritability, I think, come to misleading conclusions, which then get translated into misleading advice. Uh, likewise, studies uh, in anthropology, I think that studies of uh, warfare and violence in non-state societies have been distorted by uh, the uh, belief in the noble savage, a, a fear that if you document uh, rates of violence quantitatively, you'll be portraying people as savages and therefore uh, saying that we can't help but kill each other. Uh, and people who have tried to document it often, have often been um, shouted down, slandered, censored, and so on, which can only, uh, I think, harm our understanding both of ourselves and of indigenous peoples. So those would be two examples. And I think in general, um, it's not that anything is going to be completely innate or completely learned. Completely learned is almost a... Uh, contradiction because you need something innate to do the learning. Um, we should have an open mind, realize that um, what we learn uh, doesn't directly lead to any policy, but has to be combined with some statement of values and a, a uh, democratic means of resolving them. And the more we understand, the better we understand uh, the human mind, the better off we'll be, because the wiser our decisions will be. Yes. How much of this do you attribute to free will, starting from this heredity and environment and the individual using his reason to get the best results? Yeah. Um, well, I think the, um, there is a phenomenon that we label free will, namely there are some kinds of behavior that are involuntary, um, your <laughs> knee-jerk reflexes and um, uh, you know, particular strong emotions that we might feel. Uh, there are other aspects of human behavior that, uh, first of all, can't be predicted with certainty, and second of all, are responsive to contingencies of, uh, of uh, reward and punishment and other consequences. It's the ones that are not completely predictable and that are responsive to holding people to um, contingencies of responsibility that we call free will. Uh, the common belief is to equate free will with some soul or entity that's free of the laws of cause and effect. That's what I consider to be uh, a mistake. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it isn't worth distinguishing voluntary behavior from involuntary behavior. And certainly we have to do that to, ha to have the maximum deterrence effects in the criminal justice system. You want to, you set up punishments to deter the behaviors that are most deterrable, those are the behaviors that we tend to attribute to free will. And ironically, as Dan Dennett has pointed out, uh, that 
realistic, practical appreciation of what we want free will to do shows that the last thing we want is the idea that will is totally uncaused, because then a soul that was truly free of cause and effect could say, I don't care if you think I'm a boorish cad or if you lock me up, I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. And that would defeat the purpose of holding people responsible. You want there to be some predictability, if only statistical predictability, so that holding people responsible will have the effects that you want. Yes? Uh, in the future, it may be possible for uh, technology through implants or some other technique to uh, take over more and more of the operation of the human brain and possibly the mind, however you want to define that. Do you think that that is possible? And if so, what would be the implications for uh, theories such as yours? Yeah. Um, it, it would be, I'd be very foolish to say that anything is impossible, but I don't think it's very likely. Um, I think it's easy to get carried away by some of the techno hype of uh, roboticists that, um, you know, any sentence that begins, you will, or it's only a matter of time before, should arouse strong suspicion. Uh, the human mind is extraordinarily complex. We don't know yet how to duplicate anything in uh, any aspect of the mind in, in detail, nor do we have anything close to the technology of uh, a literal implant uh, in the brain that would control uh, the, um, the mind or substitute for thinking. There are so many boring practical problems, like how do you keep electrodes in place given that the brain is floating in fluid and moves? Uh, how do you prevent scar tissue from forming around the electrode? And it could be for a hundred boring reasons, rather than any reason in principle, that a lot of these science fiction predictions are unlikely to, to come true. And my guess is that although it's worth pursuing, especially for clear-cut cases like restoring movement to people who are paralyzed, that it, it might be worth pursuing. But uh, the idea that um, there's going to be a, a um, kind of a uh, you know, Terminator or uh, uh, Robocop uh, scenario in which silicon will actually replace high-level neural tissue, I, I think is unlikely. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I've just started reading your book, so I guess uh, you may have answered this question in the book as I go along and uh, get to the last pages. But how do you respond to the question of adaptability of genes to circumstances in the sense that are genes immutable uh, over a certain period of time? Because that goes against the whole evolutionary theory itself. So therefore, uh, because uh, the reason I'm asking this is uh, immutable heredity is often used as justification for relative uh, wrongs, like racism, for instance. And it's often used as an argument supporting inequality based on, on, on genetic uh, immutability yes. to circumstance? Well, um, I mean, genes are only immutable in the sense that Lamarck was wrong and that our experiences don't, aren't reverse coded back to systematic changes in the DNA that then get passed on to future generations. Uh, they're of course not immutable in the sense that they're constantly prone to mutation and recombination. Um, but the, um, I believe I addressed your concern in, in the part of the talk in which I discussed uh, inequality, and that is that if someone believes that there are innate differences among individuals that racism is justified, then they've made a horrendous error. Uh, that a commitment uh, um, against racism is not a factual belief that people are indistinguishable. It better not be because people are not indistinguishable and we don't want to say that class prejudice or racism or sexism are justifiable. And the reason that we can have both uh, a, the study of human uh, differences and a commitment to equality is that equality is a policy, not an empirical hypothesis, and it's a policy to recognize rights inherent in all human beings and it's a policy to treat them as individuals and not to prejudge them by statistics of a particular group that they belong to. Yes? I enjoyed reading both Wilson and Gould, and I remember Gould's uh, attacks on Wilson in the New York Review of Books, and they always seem more like uh, debaters posturing rather than a scientist at work. And I couldn't figure out why he was, to my mind, so deliberately interpreting uh, Wilson in a perverse way in order to win debating points. What was going on in, in that? Yeah. Um, I, um, 
I mean, I, I, tend, I, I tend to agree with your assessment, and I document that in the, in the book itself. Um, I think that, that um, uh, Steve Gould and, and um, the other signatories of the uh, manifesto and the other attacks on, on uh, Wilson realized that it was threatening certain um, way of justifying political ideals. Um, it, it threatened the uh, utopian politics that were popular in the early 70s and, and late 60s, according to which nothing prevents us from redesigning uh, society to be better except a failure of will. Um, that uh, there are no built-in limitations on human nature that would stand in the way of uh, a utopia with perfect egalitarianism and nonviolence. The idea that people might have uh, emotions that erupt in violence or that people may not be, uh, people have a hereditary endowment and therefore it's possible for them to vary in small ways threatened, I think, this kind of uh, utopian politics. And a lot of the, the heat uh, that came from this debate, uh, I think, really came from these political concerns, which required, therefore, demonizing the uh, opponent to make sure that no one was in danger of taking them seriously. It was thought that a greater good was at stake. One well, quick thing. I also noticed you didn't mention Freud or Jung or psychoanalysis, but it probably fits into your scheme somewhere. Which other categories would that go under? Well, Freud certainly did not believe in a blank slate, and he... Uh, <laughs> he, he, his theory endowed the mind with, uh, with many drives and motives and with, with subsystems like the superego and the uh, id. Um, and he also, uh, his theory resonates with one of the themes that I've uh, emphasized tonight, namely that the human mind uh, consists of a number of competing systems, some of them that tempt us to do uh, antisocial things and others that might um, suppress those temptations. Um, I think where uh, Freud differs strongly from what most um, personality psychologists believe now, at least those who have followed behavioral genetics, is the idea that how your parents treated you in the first six years of life shape your personality in adulthood. Uh, moreover, which I think has been refuted by the studies of adoptees and twins that show that the uh, effect of the home of the parents uh, is very small uh, to negligible. Moreover, the idea that was popular, uh, made popular by Freud, namely that psychopathology can be traced to parental uh, treatment, has been very clearly uh, refuted. The idea that, say, schizophrenia comes from uh, mothers who uh, convey mixed messages to their uh, child, damned if you do, damned if you don't, that, that turns a child into a schizophrenic or that autism is caused by uh, the refrigerator mother who is emotionally cold and distant from the child, um, a, a hypothesis made popular by Bruno Bettelheim in the Freudian tradition. Uh, we know that these are, are, are wrong, that these conditions have a genetic component uh, and they have some other cause which is not genetic, not how you were raised, and a, an important uh, scientific mystery. Yes. How would you expand on the uh, unfortunate notion that biology always seems to be associated with the negative, which seems to deny um, strong findings of biological anthropology, such as reciprocal altruism and things along these lines, where biology has, quote unquote, biological factors have significant positives? Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's certainly true that um, traditionally, Biological approaches to human nature have been uh, perceived as pessimistic, as, at, um, as uh, giving us a tragic view of humanity, of uh, emphasizing our flaws, uh, probably going back to uh, the characterization of, of um, uh, nature as red in tooth and claw. Now, I think that to some extent this is, um, uh, is justified that um, a belief in perfectibility of humans and a blind eye to human self-deception and uh, ethnocentrism and so on are, are mistakes. We're better off acknowledging the dark side of humans, the better to cope with them than to wish them away because it's just depressing, too depressing to think about. On the other hand, you're right that um, if anything, the mo most sophisticated versions of evolutionary psychology have also shown that the, the better angels of our nature, as uh, Lincoln put it, also have an evolutionary basis, such as emotions like sympathy and trust and uh, gratitude and guilt uh, and that collectively make up what we call the conscience. 
uh, that those are part of our endowment from evolution as well. And in fact, there's a, um, a whole field of psychology, a new field called positive psychology, um, founded by Martin Seligman, who's also uh, sympathetic to evolutionary psychology, that tries to identify what, what went right in, uh, in human brain evolution and to get people, both as individuals in their own lives and perhaps collectively, to take advantage of, of, the, uh, of the better angels of our nature. Yes? Yes, uh, I don't know if I have a simple question because uh, I may be confused about some elements that you try to put, uh, get across here, or um, and perhaps you can amplify a little bit more. Uh, you had toward the end you had one the, the, you had one slide and you had a slide in which you state, quoting what you said, that s selfish genes do not make for self, for a certain, do not necessarily, you didn't even use the word necessarily, you said do not make for a selfish person. Yes, but do not necessarily So my make, question right. is, well, if it's not the gene, in fact, I think you added it's, it's a process that may turn one human into a selfish person. But if that's so, then we should be concentrating on the process, not so much on the gene. And what brings my point, I think, home to me is that your last uh, answer to the question, to the uh, person who asked about um, your opinion on Freud and so forth, or how do you fit him into this uh, uh, scenario, into your scenario, uh, bothers me a little bit because you immediately discounted his theories and coupled him with Bettelheim. Now, Bettelheim is not Freud. He, may, he postdated him, but that doesn't mean he improved anything. No, he has been discounted and discredited in many ways. Chiefly, or, I might just repeat, autism is not a psychoanalytical condition. Schizophrenia, and you did mention Freud in that, with that term, is not a, a neurotic, at least from my understanding, a condition. So. What we, when we talk about Freud and psychoanalysis, I don't think we really are talking, of, meant to talk about uh, schizophrenia, uh, schizophrenics, but rather neuroses that certainly do, I think Freud showed, do originate in childhood, mm -hmm. uh, and or at least be a, either nurtured or fostered in childhood. Uh, and that's a process. You see, it's not inherent in the human, in the child, initially. It's a process. So I, I don't know if I'm confusing uh, yeah. <clears throat> you with my coupling the selfish genes, needing a process to explain what happens to turn a person into a, a, a selfish person with your comments on psychoanalysis. Yes. Well, the, the comments on, I, you're right in that my comments on psychoanalysis were really on the, uh, psychoanalytic tradition, including the uh, thinkers that postdated Freud, including uh, Bettelheim and, and others. Um, and it's true that Freud himself did not have uh, the refrigerator mother as a theory of autism, but Bettelheim did, working in a Freudian tradition and, and modifying it. But I think Freud did set the stage for um, a, a movement that was dominant in psychiatry until uh, recent decades that did try to seek the roots both of psychosis and neurosis in early childhood. Certainly, I think even most Freudians now would say, yeah, you can have psychosis. We're not going to uh, look to early childhood for that. Uh, fine, it's, it's genes and other causes. Um, it's not even clear to me, though, whether neuroses can be uh, attributed to uh, a child's relationship to his parents in the first six years of life. I know that the belief is widely held, and it's often the basis of uh, psychoanalytic psychotherapy. But um, it, I don't think it's been properly tested, and I think the studies that do bear on it uh, suggest that Freud may have been wrong about the neuroses as well, that it, it probably is not the way you were treated as a child, but pr some combination of genes and something else that's not genes, but that is not also not parental treatment. Yes? Uh, one, just one point where you're talking about, I'm having a little trouble following the logic of your argument. When, you're, when you say uh, most of the studies done on social factors and parenting, for example, 
or bad studies, and then the, and then you go to the studies that link it to genetics and say are good. Those are good studies. How, what's the criteria you're doing that on? And and if it's not identified with a specific gene, how you know to me you're kind of measuring a construct. So how do you make that evaluation? I guess. Oh, it's simple. I mean, it's just the usual criteria for social science research, namely that you shouldn't uh, attribute a correlation to causation until you measure plausible third variables that could explain the correlation. In this case, variable A is parental behavior, variable B is children's traits. Uh, the, the bad research simply interprets the correlation as a causation, uh, a causal relationship. Better research would at least measure the possible third factor uh, genes to see if it can be attributed to that as opposed to the putative cause, namely parenting. Uh, now, that's, it's not uh, the end of the story because simply knowing that sharing half a genome uh, has some causal effect uh, doesn't tell you how it has its causal effect. Uh, and I expect that the, um, a major new area of research over the next uh, few decades will be trying to get more specific about which genes do what, at what stage of the developing brain, where are they expressed, uh, what do the gene products actually do to flesh out the causal story. Uh, right now, our measures are crude, but without a measure of possible effects of the genes, you're just, uh, people would just be committing the elementary uh, logical error of confusing correlation with causation. Causation with statistics, but it, there, you could be leaving out some other factors too is my only thing. You seem like, okay, you put it hereditary stuff and now you've answered the question when you could possibly leave out other things and you're never showing causation, you're making that assumption when you can only prove correlation, right? Well, the, in, in the case of, of um, genes, there is, uh, you can rule out some of the uh, possibilities because we know that, um, say, that growing up in the same home, for example, or being similar can't be read back and, and uh, change your DNA. So that kind of correlation can only go in one direction because Lamarck was wrong. Um, but again, that's not to deny your point that it leaves a lot of things open. And moreover, I should add that this, the research that I'm referring to also measures other factors besides uh, family, uh, uh, parental behavior, and um, genetic relatedness, such as possible effects of the child on how the parent treats that child as opposed to other children. So the um, individualized parenting that pa a parent might give to one child and not another, causing two children in the same home to in fact have slightly different environments, uh, also needs to be measured. And the, uh, a, a few of the most recent studies do measure it, but come to pretty much the same conclusions. That is that uh, once you control for genetic relatedness, then differential parental treatment of one child to another seems to be a consequence of the fact that the kids are different to begin with. Uh, they don't seem to add any additional measurable effect on how the children turn out. But that would be an example of other factors that ought to be and sometimes are measured. Okay, we'll just take uh, one more? Or, or no, or end it. No, I think uh, I, I've been asked to uh, end the evening to switch over to the uh, reception and the book signing. Uh, sorry for those of you who had questions, and thanks very much for your attention. Stephen Pinker is author of The Blank Slate, The Modern Denial of Human Nature, number 10 on this week's New York Times bestseller list. It's published by Viking, an imprint of Penguin Putnam. Visit penguinputnam.com for more information. You're watching Book TV on C-SPAN 2, 48 hours of non-fiction books. Coming up at 1.30 p.m. Eastern, Spy Dust, two masters of disguise reveal the tools and operations that helped win the Cold War. Then go inside Yale's Skull and Bone Society with Alexandra Robbins, author of Secrets of the Tomb.
Tonight on Book TV, My America, Hugh Downs' new compilation of essays from 150 Americans. After that, Salman Rushdie on a decade of nonfiction essays. And on Public Lives, Kenyan political activist Koigi Wa Wamwire, whose memoir is called I Refuse to Die.